Well, hello there, it's Antrice, and welcome to another episode of the Savvy Painter Podcast. The Savvy Painter Podcast is published every other week. If you are a painter who is looking for down-to-earth, real-life conversations about art, how to create it, and how to sell it, you are in the right place. Savvy Painter has been downloaded over a million and a half times by artists in 150 countries. This is the place where you will find your community. You'll be inspired to create and you'll hear real stories from artists who are thriving with their art. So if you are new to this podcast, I want to welcome you to the Savvy Painter community, but make sure that you don't miss an episode. Sign up for weekly updates, free guides, and workshop announcements. Just go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash subscribe. It's that easy. My guest today is Vincent Gerano. Vince is an East Coast figurative and cityscape painter. In this episode, Vince chronicles exactly how he made the shift from commercial illustration into fine art. He studied fine arts at the State University of New York at Buffalo and got his master's at Syracuse. As Vince will tell you, he learned how to conceptualize and think in college, but it was comic books that taught him how to draw. Vince and I talk about his journey from fine arts into comics and illustration, and then coming back full circle into fine art. He shares how he planned his transition back, and how he thought through what he needed to make his life whole. Turns out, that was painting. Vince and I also talk about why writing has been so critical to his painting technique, his career, and for showing himself that his ideas about making a living as an artist were wrong. We also get into big questions, legacy, truth in art, why we are here, and why we tend to make some things so complicated when they're actually pretty simple. Towards the end of the conversation, Vince talks about his techniques, how he chooses his subject matter, and where he gets his models. Here is Vince Gerano. Vince, welcome to the Savvy Painter Podcast. I am delighted to have you on the show today. Thank you for inviting me. This is great. Will you tell me a little bit about when you first started out as an artist? What made you choose this as your vocation? You're talking about when I really started recently or like way back, like early experiences and stuff like that. More recently, I think. Okay. Because I started drawing like really at a young age. (laughs) Yeah. So it's way back. But uh, I always drew and I always loved drawing. And there was something immediately that I found was so engaging and inspiring and exhilarating. Just drawing things and creating. There's such a like a high that you get from it. Uh, I think in an early age, I learned that that was such a cool thing. And I knew for a long time that that was what I wanted to do and what I really uh, connected with and things like that. So, yeah, I drew from a young age. I went to art school, all that. I didn't go into fine art after college. I went to college for fine art. I didn't really uh, feel after college that I understood or identified with the fine art world. I didn't really like where it was at. And I think the schools I went to really didn't prepare me for actually being a a professional artist. So I'd always done illustration on my own. And I liked that. And that was like my sort of backup thing. And so I went into illustration after I got out of art school. And that was a really good experience. I liked that a lot. That's interesting. You studied fine art and then went into illustration. A lot of people I talked to sort of did it the other way around where they thought, okay, I need to do something practical. So I'm going to study illustration. And then they decided to go into fine arts. Yeah, there's a lot of back and forth that way. Sometimes one comes first, sometimes the other. There's such a a long history of fine artists coming from illustration. So I felt very comfortable with that. And it just didn't feel right to do fine art at that time. Uh, I wasn't ready for it. I hear this a lot from other artists as well, that they don't feel like art school really prepared them for the quote unquote real world. Sure. (laughs) So I'm curious, what did you experience and what do you wish had been available to you while you were in school? 
Well, I think I, I had a, an experience that was like a lot of people at the time. I went to a big university. I first did four years. I'm from Buffalo. I went to the University of Buffalo. I did four years undergrad there. And then after that, I went right to grad school and I did three years at Syracuse University. But the whole program of like big universities, it's very modernist driven. And it's a lot about uh, exploring and redefining art and conceptualizing. And it's just very modern aesthetic. So it's like, here's the materials, create something or be creative or find your creative self. Hit the creative button on your computer and you're good to go. Yeah, very little technical stuff, really little. And there's so many artists I know that that was their similar experience. You know, now there's so many art academies and art ateliers and stuff like that. It's it's really great. But it's kind of like they're missing the component that I had, whereas I was trained to think like an artist and how to conceptualize and stuff like that. They're kind of missing that. They're learning how to actually paint and draw really well. But I think they are very light on the conceptual aspect. You know, it's good to learn how to paint and draw, but you have to learn what to paint and draw and how to think and conceptualize and come up with your own sort of ideas and things like that. So I just found that I was able to teach myself all the technical stuff that I needed. And I felt like the thing I really got from college was how to think and um, be creative. So when you graduated and you went into illustration, were you teaching yourself then the technical aspects of painting? Is that that what you mean? Or Yeah, I taught myself everything um, that way. And it wasn't painting. It was all um, uh, drawing. I liked uh, fashion illustration. I would do various sorts of illustration side jobs when I was young. But I also, I was really into comic books, graphic novels, and visual storytelling. And I loved film and I loved animation, but I didn't want to go into film or animation because I didn't like the dynamic of those um, industries. So I loved comic books. It's where I learned a lot of my drawing. I always wanted to do that. And I think a lot of people my age gravitated towards that too, because you draw what you're exposed to. And my generation, it was um, comic books mostly. So uh, a lot of people started off drawing that way, but then they kind of went on to other things. But for me, it seemed like a real possibility and I just sort of pushed it and made it happen. So my first career after college was um, breaking into the comic book industry and drawing comic books for a bunch of years. What were some of the comic books you looked at that you found particularly helpful when you were learning how to draw? I liked uh, mainstream comic books, superhero comic books. So I liked all the stuff I saw from the big companies, which were Marvel Comics and DC Comics. So I liked all of that. And when I trained myself to draw that way, I was looking at all the... um, Top people uh, at the time, like uh, Jack Kirby and Jim Steranko and Neil Adams and, you know, all the top people and definitely like the best people as far as rendering and action and layout. And Frank Miller, uh, when he came on the scene, it was just like a bombshell because his influences from film, you could see it in his work, his visual storytelling and um his concepts and stuff like that were just so great. So that was a big influence too. Would you include graphic novels in that as well? Or is it strictly like the classic comic book? It's pretty much the same thing. It's in an interchangeable um, title, I guess. Comic books or graphic novels, about the same. Uh, Some people think of a graphic novel as being bigger. It's about it. Right. It seems like with that sort of influence, studying that way that you would learn obviously a lot about anatomy and dynamic poses and that kind of stretching, reaching, (laughs) very dynamic. Yeah, a lot of dynamic stuff. Yeah. Exaggeration. Yeah, (laughs) an exaggeration. Also, it seems like you would sort of by default, if you're copying those, get a really good feel for compositional elements within a particular set of 
canvases, for lack of a better word, or the panels like that, those boxes that they would fit things into and breaking the the wall. Yes, absolutely. Um, there's the composition of the individual panel, and then there's the composition of the whole page. And I always liked to have a strong composition for the whole page because I was thinking in terms of the reader not just going from panel to panel, but also getting something from the whole page and that having a flow and a dynamic and creative layout, things like that. How did you end up bringing that into your painting? First off, I think being a professional and doing that for quite a few years, that really helped me to learn how to be professional and how to interact with people in a professional way and how to conduct myself and things like that. So that was a really valuable experience. Could you give a couple examples of that? Deadlines. (laughs) Actually meeting deadlines? (laughs) deadlines and not being a slave to inspiration, knowing how to create your own inspiration and to produce because you can't just wait for that. You have to produce every day, day after day, and you've got a deadline and you've got to do this book. So I learned how to get around not waiting for inspiration. How did you do that? That was a problem in uh, college. I would just be stuck like waiting for uh, inspiration. One thing that I've sort of developed even more uh, when I got to painting is to have a, a mix in your life, a mix of elements and things that keeps creativity going. So I think that's a really key thing. I've sort of learned my mixture of what I need and what helps that way. But another thing is you just train yourself to start and not procrastinate, and just to go. And that's a big part of it. So a couple questions I have about that. What are the types of things that you include to give you that variation? Like I don't, doesn't necessarily have to be like, I do this particular thing. But is it a mix of painting activities with a completely different activity that sort of resets your brain? Or Sure, that's part of it changing subject, changing how you paint. I mean, I think most painters have like several ways of painting. And so I think that's a great thing to do. It mixes things up and um, keeps it fresh. Going and doing plein air painting or painting in the studio or doing uh, figure drawing. Like I'll go to a figure drawing group almost every week. And that's a great way of networking uh, with other artists and also just the different activity. And Drawing the figure is just such a great thing. It's like the best exercise you can do for keeping your eye sharp, which uh, I think that's a really important thing. Or I go uh, work with people in uh, New York City, and that's a different experience. You know, so just a number of activities and different things you can do with your art. And it keeps things fresh and it keeps the inspiration going. Uh, Writing is a huge thing for me. Uh, That's part of that mix. Writing. Yeah, uh, that's really big, especially um, for my transition from illustration to fine art. I used writing in a really functional way, and um, it continues to be like something that helps me to work out ideas, and it keeps me focused and uh, organized in my career and my creative uh, side and all that. It's terrific. I highly recommend it. I am a huge fan of both journaling about what I'm doing and then doing like, I just call it like a brain vomit. (laughs) 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 It's just, (laughs) I don't know how else to say it. It is just. Yeah, you got to get that stuff out of your head. Yeah. Yeah. Just write for a set amount of time or a certain number of pages and none of it makes sense. It's never complete sentences. It jumps around like a pinball machine. It has zero flow or anything, but it just helps like release whatever it is. And eventually something comes out. You got to write down all ideas, good ideas, bad ideas. You write them down. That helps you figure out what's good and what's bad and what you want to do. I write down about research. I do everything I need to for the business side. 
And that was big when I was making the transition was just a lot of research. Uh, there's a lot of things you have to figure out as far as like uh, your painting technique, but also all the business side stuff, galleries, being professional, uh, framing, keeping track of work. I mean, all that stuff. There's so much. Can you give an example of how your writing specifically helped with that aspect, like the business side and getting yourself more professional? You don't have to give exact details if you don't want to, but I'm just really curious about things like, were you analyzing how you behaved and then sort of giving like a postmortem on something that happened or... No, I don't think I did that. But just taking things out of your head and putting them on paper right there, that's a big jump. If you're just going by what's in your head and mem remembering things, it, it just isn't enough. If you put them down on paper, you've had to at least do some sort of consideration and thinking about that thing. And you're editing and getting down to more uh, precise information. And then you can rewrite the same thing. Like, in the beginning, I would rewrite every time I learned new things, tweaking my process for painting and different processes. And then it becomes second nature because you've done it so many times. I mean, when you first start painting, there's so many things you're juggling, especially like plain air painting. That's where I started off. And there's so much you have to know. So by writing and rewriting things, you really get a better grasp on it. Teaching is another thing that helps you to get a handle because it shows you what you know in a different way. But the writing, I would do all sorts of research, whatever I needed. And also when you write things, you figure out what you know and you figure out what you don't know. And when you target what you don't know, then you go and get that piece and then you fill it in. And so it's very organized. And I feel like I progressed faster and more organized because of that process. It was great. I did a five-year transition. I figured that's what I needed. I did a five-year plan, and that was all written down. Each year, I had different goals, and um, it progressed, getting harder and harder as I went along and doing different things, and f also focusing in on what I wanted to do uh, with painting, because there's so many things you can do. I had like a huge long list that I made to start with of everything I could think of that a painter could do. And then as I went along, I would say, no, did that. I didn't like that. Cross that off. And then I focused in. So, you know, a negative is as good as a positive. Absolutely. I have this enormous smile on my face and I'm kind of like <laughs> laughing a little bit because I, all I'm thinking is like, we are there. <laughs> oh, cool. Nice. <laughs> I think a lot. I just want to point out that you had a five-year plan to make that transition. I really like the fact that it's realistic. I think a lot of people think, oh, I'm going to make that switch. I'll give myself six months to do it, which is ambitious <laughs> and gives you something to shoot for. But the problem with it is it's often not realistic at, at all. Like this is... It's a business. It is a life choice. It takes a lot, an enormous amount of time and effort. And it is never something that happens overnight. And when we see that, I think it's just our, we see what we want to see because we love the idea of the overnight success, but we sort of like. Now you got to be objective and you got to be realistic. Also the five years, that was a see how it goes kind of thing. At any point, I could have gone out of it. It really depended on my progress and being objective about how I was progressing. And it really wasn't until the end of the five years that if I achieved what I wanted to achieve, then I would go ahead and, and then go to like professional galleries and stuff like that. Can you talk a little bit more about the idea of finding what doesn't work? And I'm curious about that. Like you said that it is just as valuable to be like, cross something out and be like, nope, that did not work. Or I hated every second of that. I never want to do that again. Super valuable thing to do. I'm curious though, did you, were you ever in a situation where you were hesitant to do that because of the idea of the sunk cost that you'd already invested X amount of time or energy or something into it? 
and have that feeling of like, if I quit this line on my possibilities of things that I might do off of my list, I've just wasted, wasted in air quotes, X number of months or years or whatever. Did you ever encounter that? No. And that whole five years was such a great thing because I looked at it as a journey and I looked at it as everything I did would benefit me in some way, whether it was good or bad or whatever. It was all helpful and it was all things that would benefit me. And so I never had that feeling. And I really, even though things were hard and I was struggling, I really tried to focus on enjoying where I was at the time and realizing that was what I wanted to do. And it wasn't just a conscious effort to think that. I was really feeling that painting to me was just so much fun and I was really enjoying it. And so I I really had a great time, you know, the whole way, I think. So I, I loved it. It worked. That is an outstanding mindset. I think that we all aspire to have, (laughs) I think. You can't focus on the end goal. And I think I realized that early on. There's no reaching something and then coasting. That's not the point of it. The point is to enjoy the experience, to enjoy what you're doing. Never stop learning. You don't just obtain something. It's a lifestyle. And that's another component of it. You're always learning. You're always challenging yourself. And I think that's an important aspect of it. That's excellent way to approach it. I think it's so simple, but it's... Yeah, right. It seems simple. (laughs) (laughs) But was it? (laughs) It's great. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Problem solved. We're done now, Vince. (laughs) Yeah, I wish it was that simple. I talk about I've talked about that a lot, just this idea that we make things so much more complicated than they actually are. The solution usually is the simplest solution. It's just not easy. And there's a big difference. I think a big thing is is getting in the right frame of mind and conditioning yourself that way and just being prepared mentally. I see some people that can't progress because they're stuck in the wrong mental state. Like some people say, oh, I used to draw so well years ago. They can never get beyond that. And so they're not in the right frame of mind. You're always going to get better. And it's always about the next painting. Not holding on, not looking back. You have to focus forward and just enjoy that. And I think that's a a huge thing. But some people just don't have the right mindset for what you need. Did you always have that sort of mindset? Or was there a point where, where you just kind of realized, okay, I'm approaching this wrong, and I need to just enjoy the ride and enjoy the process? Around the time that I started the writing, I was doing illustration. And I loved the field of comics. That was very rewarding. But then at a certain point, the business hit a slump and I moved on from that to other illustration work because it was easier to get. And it was good money, but I hated it. It just was empty. It didn't have the things that I liked about the comic industry, the creativity. So I hit a point where I had this uh, feeling that There was something I was supposed to be doing, and I knew I wasn't doing it. And so that was a big wall that I hit. And that's when I started the process of writing, because I felt like I needed to figure out who I was and what I wanted, because I knew there was something, but I wasn't doing it. And it was very frustrating. And I felt like so lost, unbelievably lost and confused. And I just didn't know where my place was. And then when I found painting, it was like a light went on. It was like I found the thing that I was looking for and the reason I'm here. And it just was like so huge to me that when I laid out my five-year plan, I really was of the feeling like 
I was fighting for my life, fighting for my identity. And I really went after it in a big way because I knew what the alternative was, <laughs> which was bad. And so I really wanted the painting thing to work. And so I was very uh, motivated. Mm -hmm. There's a cost to painting that I think people don't always take into account. I think you have to be sort of willing to pay that cost. Yeah. And you have to be a little obsessed. I was very, I was very obsessed uh, and focused. Yeah, I think, um, what was it? Another, uh, Scott Connery is a, another artist that I interviewed. And I, I think he said it's an obsession almost bordering on delusion and flirting with mental derangement that you have to have in order to be an artist. And, and I think it's kind of true. And I think that identification that you made that you had no idea what it was, it sounds like, but you just knew that there was something blocking you. Yeah. And the payment that you had to make <laughs> was to dig into that and figure it out. Yeah. Uh, I had to really uh, do some soul searching. Part of it also was my wife and I had two children and having children, it's so huge as far as giving of yourself that I found I lost track of who I was because they really take up so much of your time and um, everything. So I felt like I'd lost touch with who I was and what I wanted. And so the writing was really instrumental in me figuring out a lot of things that way. And then when I found painting, that was the thing. I started figure drawing and then meeting artists. And that was the bridge to then painting because it was figure drawing and then hanging out with artists and then going in plein air painting or uh, hiring a model for an afternoon and doing a, a long pose. And that was the bridge to um, then gave me the idea because I'd never thought of being a fine artist as a practical way of making a living. So I started seeing, you know, this looks possible. And then right at that time, there were starting to happen some exciting things in realism. And I was looking at people like Sargent and uh, Soroyo, you know, some of the artists that I liked way back a long time ago. And then I, I sort of rediscovered what I felt about art. And it turned out to be realism, which is was radically different than what I did in college, which was more like postmodern conceptual art. People tease me because I like to ask, or I just naturally, I guess I ask sort of like the big questions, but what impact would you like to make with your art? The thing I felt early on uh, when I was trying to figure out what I wanted and when I started to think about being a fine artist again, the thing that really was uh, foremost in my mind was that I wanted my work to be about truth. I didn't even know what that meant. But I think I was kind of reacting to what I used to do in fine art when I was in school and such. And I felt like it was um, it was fake and it was kind of a gimmick and it just wasn't sincere. That's how I felt about the art world and about what contemporary art I saw. And so I was really feeling this strong urge to do something that was sincere. And the thing that I focused on was I wanted it to be about truth. And then it took me a long time to figure out what that meant. But that was my feeling. And that's what I paint for. Sincerity and truth of life, truth of experience and things like that. Mm -hmm. I guess that's what I like most. <laughs> my legacy. <laughs> <laughs> the legacy is truth. Well, it's Again, simple but not easy. And I think that's... It doesn't have to be complicated. All the stuff I saw in the art world, it was just fancy footwork. It was just complicated, complicated. I'm going to be more complicated than the other guy, you know? It, it just seems so insincere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a part of it is there's... I don't know what it is. I don't know if this is describing it correctly, but it feels to me like there's a certain amount of insecurity in the art world. And the way that you compensate for that is to get hyper intellectual and hyper 
complicated because that seems like it shows that you are uh, super hyper intelligent. But I think that the more difficult thing is simplicity and the more difficult thing is truth. And to me, that seems like what, you know, philosophers have been looking for for thousands of years is what does it mean to be a human in this world that we live in? You know, it's a big question. <laughs> Why That's the are question we here? I like. Yeah. What is it like to be here? Yeah. Our experience now, I focus on that. And it doesn't have to be complicated. Why does it have to be complicated? Or why does it have to be art that's redefining art? That's not whoever said that that was the thing that you had to do. You know, art doesn't have to be always redefining art. We've seen that and we've seen the progression of that and we've seen the end of it. It, it ends with a can of feces, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Or a pile of garbage on a gallery wall or a museum uh, floor. <laughs> right. Or somebody dropped their glasses on the floor and everybody thinks it's an installation piece. <laughs> right. And after you've seen something that's supposed to be shocking, after you've seen it a hundred thousand times, it's not shocking anymore. So why still do that? Right. It doesn't make sense. And it just seems insincere. I'm not into poking people's eyes. I think beauty is an important thing. I think it should be uplifting. It should be um, something that makes you feel, not something that just pisses off the viewer. I, I'm not into that. Mm -hmm. So as a segue to that conversation, how do you choose your subject matter? What is it that you look for and decide, that's what I'm going to do right now? Writing. That's where I start. I have. I have continue to write and think things through. And if I have an idea or something I like, I'll write about it and explore it that way. And then I'm sort of prepared and I have that sort of base. And then I do a lot of figure work. So I'll find someone that speaks to me about one of the things that I've thought about and planned. And I don't follow my original plan too closely it's sort of like a ground and it's just sort of there. But before I work with someone, I'll write specifically about that person. Then I kind of let that go too, because when you're working with someone, it's about things that come from them. And so in the end, my painting is partly what comes from the person and the situations and the scenes and stuff and the experiences. And then partly what I see in that person. Um, so part of it is me projecting my thoughts and feelings and things like that. So when I work with someone, I don't want to know everything about them. Some people want to know their subject completely. I like to have a sense of mystery, things I don't know, because then uh, that allows me to project and things come from me and then things come from them. And it becomes this kind of combination and I really like that dynamic, and I find it creative. Where do you find your models? They're friends or friends of friends, and sometimes I'll find someone on social media that I think is really interesting. Or uh, one time I saw a blog, a fashion blogger. Her name was Aretta, and I saw her blog, and I was blown away because she just is so passionate about clothing. And this is her lifestyle. And so I was like, I would love to do a painting of something about her life. So um, she just basically travels and wears outrageous clothes every day. And that's her life. I've always liked the clothing industry. For me, it's very interesting. I love it. I think of it like architecture, clothing and architecture. They're kind of this really big classic subject. But I've always had an interest in clothing. And so uh, I got to work with Aretta. She was coming to New York City to do um, Fashion Week. So up front, before I even met her, I had the feeling like I want to paint something that's a truth about her, something about her real life, not things that are sort of like the glamorous 
so much, not like runways and things like that or fashion week. I wanted something about fashion week and her and about her daily life. That was my initial focus. And then when I worked with her, I got new ideas from working with her. In the end, the painting uh, worked out really well, I felt. And it was a combination of what I felt and what I got from her. How did that actually work? So she was coming to New York for this just idle curiosity. But you know how we artists are, we're like, well, exactly what did you? (laughs) But but I get this question a lot about like, how do you find your models? And how does that work? So she was coming for Fashion Week. So did you you invited her to your studio? And then you tell me. We'd emailed. And in working with people, people don't have a lot of time. Exactly. And especially people like her, they have very little time and they could be really busy. But, you know, sometimes those are really interesting people to work from. So what I found works best for me is if I can get enough visual information, then I can work at my leisure and I can take the three or four weeks or months or whatever I need to get what I want, but they don't have that time. And also a lot of times what I want to capture is something fleeting. And so that's not going to be there. So what I've found works best is I do a photo shoot and I can do drawings. I could do a small oil study so that I have that information and experience. But also if I just take like tons of images then I can get the visual information I need, and then I can sort of sift through it. And that's how I work it. I've done plenty of plein air painting, and I've done plenty of studio painting. And to me, it's really kind of the same. When you're looking at something, you're making choices and decisions, and you edit, and you arrange things, whether you're outside, Uh, or working uh, from a still life or working in the studio from images. It's choices and stuff like that. So if I get enough visual information, I'm good. So you set up a photo shoot, basically. Did you need to learn then about how to take pictures and all of that? Or do you have somebody help you with that? No, I do that all on my own. And I know enough to get what I need. It doesn't have to be perfect. Because like I said, I'm just looking for information. So I'll bracket exposures and then, you know, I can see, I need to see all that I can. Uh, I need to see in the light areas. I need to see in the dark areas. And then I'm going to make choices. And just because something is true is what you're seeing. That's not necessarily what works on the painting. So the painting is the thing that takes precedence. That's going to be on the wall in the end. Nobody's going to see anything else. So it has to work on the painting. So I change shapes. I change things. I change colors. Anything I can to make the painting the thing that works. That's what's important. I I think that we are kind of from a similar close enough generation. Do you think the art world, as I always do the air quotes, um, have gotten over the fact that artists use photographs or do you still feel like it's taboo? No, I think it's fine. I've seen plenty of work from life that is terrible. That is not any guarantee that things are going to work out. It really is your decision making and what you know to make it work. I've seen Also, tons of paintings from photographs that are terrible. You have to learn what to do and what not to do, whether you're working from images or whether you're working from life. And my experiences, plein air painting, trained me to think in those terms. So that was like really valuable experience. And I continue to do it. And while I'm painting in the studio, I keep those experiences in mind because that's what helps you figure out what to do and what not to do. Mm-hmm. It's all the tools, all the memories, all the resources Absolutely. that we have collected in our memories of information that we can bring on to the canvas. Absolutely. How should you do a painting? Any way you can, because it's really about that thing in the end. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, then it doesn't matter how you did it. So you, we have permission from Vince and countless other artists photography, use it. It's a thing. (laughs) Just like the internet, 
It happened. It's a tool. Paint from your memory. Do whatever. Do a combination. Whatever you need to do, do. But another consideration for me that I sort of figured out on my way to professional painting was how does this actually work? Because if you're painting strictly from life, early on, I could tell that that had limitations. There was expenses and there was time factor and productivity. And those are things you have to think about because you have to produce enough to make a living. And if you're producing too little and your prices are so high, no one's buying it, then that's not good either. So you have to consider the business side and you have to be practical as far as how you're actually going to survive as a fine artist. And so you have to have those things weigh into your business plan. And that was one of the early things that I wrote about. A friend of mine in figure drawing said, you got to have a business plan. And that was all he said. And he never told me anything else about it. And I could never get any other information. So I was like, okay, I'm going to do this on my own. What's a business plan? And I just sort of logically figured out what a business plan was. And I developed my own business plan. And, you know, part of it is being productive and prices and having collectors and galleries. And you got to figure out how you fit into all that and how to actually be a professional artist. Yeah. And that's another thing that we that artists just don't want to avoid completely, I think. And And part of that is we have this, I don't know, it's like a schizophrenic thing that about artists and how we fit into this world, I guess, but we're sort of conditioned to believe that art is pure and that you shouldn't sully it or dirty it with any, you know, monetary considerations. And then at the same time, especially in the United States, we live in a society that building wealth is important. Taking care of yourself is important. Having a roof over your head, food on the table. <laughs> Right. Clothes on your back. Those are all really important things. So we're sort of like on the one side told like, oh, artists are lazy and they're parasites and, you know, like the starving artists Part of that's and all a that stereotype crap. Too. Yeah. It's a stereotype that a lot of artists are aware of, obviously, and interact with on some level on a given day based on how, you know, people's response to them being an artist. And then on the other hand, you have the art world or the art schools telling you, don't be dirty. <laughs> don't be dirty. It's realistic. You have to, if you want to survive, someone who's a mediocre artist, but has people skills and business skills will do way better than someone who is super talented and doesn't have those things or is not good at those things. It's real. It's that's how it is. You have to have a balance. You have to have that other um, side of it. Those other components. You have to know how to deal with people and be professional and how to work it as a business. It's important. Otherwise, you won't survive. Right. And you know, if nothing else, you won't be able to afford your paints. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But more importantly, I don't think we're here to suffer. I don't believe that myself. No, that's no fun. No. Why do we need to do that? Yeah, then that's not, you're not doing it. So <laughs> if you're going to do it, you should do it. Do it right. And there is a way. All you have to do is figure it out, think logically, make a plan. And I think writing is, is such a cool part of that. And it makes stuff happen. Writing just makes it happen. Yeah. This is a bizarre question, but do you write, you write longhand? You're not typing it. I just use a blank sketchbook and I sketch in it or I write. Uh, some things are just lists. Um, some things are research and ideas. And no, it's not like all journaled. I can do that. But some it is just ideas, short sentences, lists, all sorts of stuff like that. I'm just asking because I've noticed for myself that I feel so much more of a connection and it feels more like everything that you just talked about, about why you write, all the benefits. I feel like I get that when I write by hand more than I do when I type it into a computer. It feels like there's a disconnect or something. There's something about yeah. moving your hand. That's a big difference, Yeah, I think. It could depend on, you know, like someone might be more comfortable like typing into notes on their iPhone or something like that. But 
I like writing stuff down. I like to have a hard copy of something. So I know people are going to be wondering about this. When you were started writing out your business plan, what were some of the things that you considered to sort of help you? Like, so when your friend said, you need a business plan, and you're like, okay, let me figure that out. How did you go from what is that to I've got something I can work with? I'll have to think back for a minute. Yeah, I mean, that was a long time ago. Uh, it seems like a long time ago. Part of it was I just started thinking logically. You know, what do I need? And I started thinking about all the different aspects. You know, like you have to write about promotion, uh, self-promotion, press. How are you going to sell? Simple questions. How are you going to sell? Who are you going to sell to? What are you going to sell? What level of craft should your work have to be professional? You know, you go to shows, you go to galleries, you're looking at artwork for other things like framing, materials. You can tell when somebody has a higher level of craft and you're like, wow, that guy is really professional. That speaks to me, you know, in a professional way. That's good stuff. So little by little, you pick up things and really it's just thinking logically and picking things up as you go. But there's, you know, all the different aspects of the business side. You have to keep records. Yes. That's another thing. You have to keep track of everything. So paperwork, you have to keep track of all the information on all your paintings, images of all your paintings, and where it goes, trafficking. Because if you're not, then you're losing track of all that stuff and quickly. It's amazing. You can forget where a painting is. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. You think you never would, like losing track of your children or something, but you will. Oh, yeah. I mean, once you start producing work to the point of being able to support yourself and make a living and work with galleries, that adds up. That's a lot of work. And for myself, I tend to produce a lot of work. And so it's quite a bit to keep track of. How do you keep track of it? Do you? I have a spreadsheet thing. Uh, I think it's uh, numbers is the program. And uh, I just set up a spreadsheet where it has... uh, the paintings, and then uh, all the information across that is pertinent information, price, where it is, uh, who showed it, show history, if I know the collector, just little facts like that. Here's a question that you've probably Did you get got- paid? <laughs> did you, <laughs> did get, you get, paid? get paid? Yeah, did they pay you? <laughs> How did much check- did you get paid? <laughs> Was there a discount? Uh, did you do the frame? Did the gallery do the frame? There's all that stuff. It's a lot to keep track of. Yeah. And like you said, with the journaling thing, like once you write it down, you can just let it go out of your head. But if you don't like keep track of it like that, then you're always just kind of in the state of anxiety about what do I do? What do I do? Or what did I do? Yes, I think so. This is probably the most common question I hear. And it's usually kind of like shyly asked. So I will just straight out ask it. And here's how I'm going to ask it. Here's how I can do it. What advice would you give to somebody who's in the early stages of their career about how to price their work? Oh, that's easy. You look at other artists that are at the same level as you. You gather up as much information as you can, even if they're not exactly like you. It's good to get a range of information. Anytime you can gather price information is good. But the best is finding someone who's been painting as long as you is in the same sort of range as you, showing in the sort of galleries you see. So you get like information and look at it like that. And pricing, you have to think long term. You never want to get to the point where you've overpriced yourself and you want to climb. You don't want to have to come back down. So you can't always depend on a gallery to have that in mind. So you have to think long term and about not reversing. Mm -hmm. I think if your career took off and you really felt that, then you would know. But if you're like, I don't really know if I should or shouldn't raise my prices, you probably shouldn't. Unless you have something clear that is telling you, yeah, you should raise your prices like your work all just sold right out or things like that. There's great demand. Those are real markers. Otherwise, you should think of pricing it probably on the low side. I think early on, 
one of my business decisions, one of my business plans was to gain collectors more than make a killing. So that was my price concept. I priced my work to gain collectors because when you gain a collector, they usually buy more than one painting. So it's more important to gain collectors than to make tons of money on a painting. Mm -hmm. Sort of point something out for people like, I love that you had sort of a goal with your pricing, that it wasn't just slap a price on it. And, you know, that you had an objective. A concept. Yeah, a concept, an objective, a business plan, (laughs) something that you knew you needed in order to make this work for you. Unless something changes in your career, come up with what is the best reason for your pricing. And for me, it was clearly gain collectors more than make money, make enough money to keep going. But the more important thing was to pick up collectors. Mm -hmm. I love it. Excellent. (laughs) (laughs) It's very helpful how specific you are with you have reasons for what you did. It's not just like, oh, because somebody told me to or, oh, I looked around and everybody else was doing it, which you see a lot. And sometimes that works. But that works probably the same percentage of the time that it works for, you know, a high school girl from Iowa to move to Hollywood and become the next star. (laughs) You know, it happens. There are examples of that. You can't say it doesn't work. But chances are won't. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of stuff to figure out. Um, so somebody beginning, uh, write a business plan and you got to think things through. You have to approach it like you're a small business because that's what you are. You're a small business. So you have to have all the things that a small business would um, have to do. Yeah. And I think the other thing that's really important is, like you mentioned, that you have to be willing to change it. So you can write a five-year plan today. And I think where some people get stuck is they they just are like writer's block deer in the headlights because they think, I can't predict the future. How do I create a plan that I know will work? You don't. You make a plan, you follow it, and adjust along the way. Do your best guess. My five-year plan, part of it also was my son was just a baby when I was starting off. So a big part of the five years was his going to school. And little by little, your time opens up. Like first, he's in school for half a day, and then he's in for a full day. And then he's more independent. So you have to take into account some of those factors that are part of your real life. And then I figured, oh, well, I need to get a certain amount of technical skill. I had a lot of drawing under my belt, but I had very little painting. And there was a a big divide between what I knew and what I needed to know. For my illustration work, I had a lot of drawing under my belt, but it was all drawing from my mind. And what I needed was observational skills. So that's like the opposite, where you're turning off your mind and you're listening to your eyes. I was originally the other way it's all drawing from knowledge you have so i had to learn that and figure drawing was huge for that that was great because it trains you to block out your mind and to be objective to what is actually coming in through your eyes and things like that yeah the amount of focus and presence that you need while you're Figure drawing and plein air painting, I think both of those, to me, I always think of them as sort of forms of meditation in a way, because you have to turn everything off and just be. Yes, exactly. That's how I feel about it. It is like meditating almost. Yep. Well, Vince, this has been a wonderful conversation. I want to ask you one last question before we go, though. Um, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I would love for you to tell us about what you're working on right now. I am just finishing up a painting. There's a competition I was in once before. Uh, It's called the Outwin Boochiever. It's one of the big competitions. I think the only other one I know that's like it is the BP Portrait Award in London. So this one's our BP, and it's at the Smithsonian in Washington. 
I did a painting specifically for that. And the competition is about redefining portraiture. It's very hard to get in. It's very competitive. They only choose, I think, 48 paintings. And that's across all mediums, which that's even harder. I mean, you're competing with everything, sculpture, video, drawing, whatever, everything. And so I was in one year and it was such a cool experience. So I would like to take another shot at that. Um, so I did a painting and I'll enter that. I think the deadline's coming up in a couple of days. I worked with a friend of mine in the city. When I work with someone, I have to sort of figure out who they are and I have to sort of see into their life. And so sometimes there's a huge difference between who I work with. This is someone who's just a young person in the city and a model, sort of an alt model, an alternative model. What does that mean? An alternative model is like not mainstream model, different body types, piercings, tattoos, and stuff like that. So that's like been a growing industry, alt models. And so she works as an alt model. And so she's very tattooed. And that was interesting to work with that aspect of a person. And so I did a, a scene of her in her bedroom. It's very moody and it's got a, a strong narrative element. And I like that. I think it makes you wonder who this person is and what they're thinking. And I love bedrooms because that seems to be the room where a person's personality is all over the walls and they really affect that space. And so I like that because it's like the space is talking about that person as much as their likeness. And I love that combination and that play back and forth. So it's a very moody scene of her and you see her tattoos. They're very prominent. There's just a really kind of intense uh, mood. And I don't usually have the subject looking at the viewer, but in this one, she is. And so that's part of me exploring and challenging myself and finding new ground and trying something different. And I try to do that whenever I can, because that's how you find new things. So I'm very happy with the piece. I just finished it yesterday, and I think it's going to be good. But now I have two paintings that I have to decide which is the stronger one for this competition. You can only put one painting in. And so I really want to choose the right one. But this one I just finished, I feel really good about it. But there's another one I did recently that could also work. So that's another thing, competitions, part of the business plan. How are you going to get yourself, your work out to people? And so being selective in competitions is one thing. Right, right. And which competitions do you select? About that painting that you just finished, I'm really curious, what made you decide to have her look directly at the viewer? I've been writing about that aspect of whether someone is looking at the viewer or not, and what it means. And a lot of my painting has been where you're observing someone, and they're either in their own thoughts, or they're unaware that they're being observed. And I was doing that for specific reasons because it tied in with my ideas about sincerity and truth in that when someone is unaware and they're in their own thoughts, their face and their body language is very different. When you're with someone or observed by someone, you're acting and you're reacting to that person. It changes your face, it changes your body and all that stuff. And so for a long time, I've been exploring that side of someone being truly themselves when they're not being that sort of reaction to someone. But then again, to explore someone actually looking at the viewer, that's a big change. So that's what I'm sort of exploring. And some things I do for very specific reasons. I'll write about it. I'll think about it. And I'm like, yes, that's a conscious choice. I'm going to do that. But then other things, I just sort of work intuitively and you just sort of let them happen. And then you learn from that and you explore that. And that's the great thing about painting is it's this exploration and discovery. 
and I love that. You know, that's what's great about it. Yeah, and the sense of curiosity, I think, that we have about what is this? What's happening? What is this relationship between this person on the canvas and me, the painter, or the person who's looking at it? Absolutely. It's all part of the journey, and it's a journey of discovery. And to have everything all ironed out, that's boring. You've got to have a certain amount that is the unknown, and um, that's so fun. Okay, so I lied. I already said I was that was going to be the last question. So I'm a big fat liar. But I got to ask, what are you thinking about when you're looking at the two paintings to decide which one goes into the show? I don't know. It's going to be hard because I like them both in different ways. I'm going to ask some people that I think will have a bead on the competition, know something about it, and sort of hear what they say. Because I'll tell you, uh, getting reaction is part of it. Showing your work to people, sharing your work. Like social media, I share a lot on Instagram. And that is such a cool thing because I get response. And I can tell how successful a painting is or how much people react to it by the response I get. To me, that's really valuable um, because I'll like a painting for certain reasons. But to know that it really hits people in a big way, that's a good thing. That's research. That's information about the subjects you're painting. So I like to know that. That's fun. So definitely sharing and getting feedback is a good thing. I try not to do so much that it's you can't paint by committee. So I don't get into that. You have to be of one mind when you're painting. But getting information afterwards, I think, is good stuff. Vince, thank you so much. I had so much fun talking with you. It was a great conversation. Oh, thanks. I really enjoyed talking with you. And thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. There's going to be links to all of your your social networks and your website and, and all of that in the show notes. But just real quickly, since we were just talking about it, what's your Instagram handle? It is Vigerano. So if anybody wants to see what Vince is working on, then that will absolutely be in the show notes so you can follow him. Cool. I'd love that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much to Vince Gerano for being on this episode of the Savvy Painter podcast. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Vincent as much as I did. You can go to SavvyPainter.com and click on the podcast link to see show notes for this episode. You'll find examples of Vince's work, links to connect with him, and links to any of the artists that we mentioned. You can also see Vince's work at gerano.com. The Savvy Painter Podcast is made possible in large part by artists just like you. If you would like to help out, it's quick, it's easy, and I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. Just go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash support. If this podcast has made a difference in your studio, if it gives you a little bit of company while you are painting, please consider making a donation. Any amount helps. And with that, I would like to give a shout out and a big, big thank you to Renat Gorin, Psychodynamic Yoga, Lois McCarthy, Robert Doucette, Denise Presnell, Sheree Seinkiewicz, Cherie, I really hope I said your last name right. Vivian Larkins, Diane Foster, Julie Riley, Leanne Harrison, Nicola Pixworth, Diane McGee, Robert Talbert, Judith Chapman, Susan Rose, Helen O'Connor, Julie Marr, J.A. Moore, Marilyn Creary, Teresa Hill, Vincent Keeling, Brian Buckrell, Alchemy Works, Denise Klitsey, Deb Cook Shapiro, Gleary Fine Art, Lucinda Kasser, Pat Oxley, Jill Opelka, Susan Zefting Kuhn, Kathleen Speranza, ZB Gallery, and David Gorski. Thank you so, so much for your support of the Savvy Painter. So until the next time, this is Antrice Wood with the Savvy Painter Podcast. Thank you so much for listening.